Today I'm excited to bring to you a video that will really help you improve your live or online cash game skills. It is one of my favorite parts from my extensive cash game masterclass where we are going to be discussing playing very deep stacked and the adjustments you need to make to crush one, two, no limit hold them all the way up to five, 10 or even higher. We're gonna discuss when you should be getting it all in before the flop for 200 big blinds or more. I know a lot of you get it in way too light. I'm actually gonna give you access to a brand new series we just released at pokercoaching.com by one of my favorite poker players in the world, Jonathan Jaffe. He gets in there, he battles hard, he understands game theory optimal strategy very well, but also how to adjust to take advantage of whatever his opponent's doing correctly. And you can get access to that right now at pokercoaching.com slash crush. Let's discuss 200 big blind deep stacked adjustments. And understand that the adjustments you should make become bigger and bigger as you get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper stacked. We have to discuss a specific point though. So we're going to discuss 200 big blinds, but realize if you are 150 big blinds, the adjustments will be less dramatic. If you're 500 big blinds deep, then the adjustments will be more dramatic. That said, nearly everything we've discussed 100 big blinds deep still applies, except for there are a few key differences you must take into account as you get deeper. The first is that your stack off threshold, which is the amount of equity you need to happily get all in, is higher. So you're gonna need better and better hands to be happy getting in bigger and bigger chip stacks. Also, being in position is more and more important because it allows for you to use larger bet sizes and raises and build the pot bigger and bigger as you see fit. And also, the nut advantage drives your overall strategy to an even larger degree than your equity advantage as you get deeper and deeper. And the ability to make the nuts and block the nuts becomes even more and more important. And we're going to discuss these three things. And you're going to see that all of them, all of the adjustments uh, that you will be making deep stacked are to some extent derived from these three big differences. So first things first, your stack off threshold increases. And to be clear, the stack off threshold is the point at which a hand becomes strong enough such that you are happy to play for all the money right away. As a very clear example of the differences that deep stacks make, let's say you're playing 20 big blinds deep and the button raises, you defend king nine of hearts in the big blind, the flop comes king seven two. You check, the button continuation bet small. And at this point, king nine, 20 big blinds deep, top pair okay kicker is a premium hand that you are happy to play for all the money so you're going to check raise and you're going to call it off if your opponent shoves yes you're going to be beat sometimes but when you are beat you only lose 20 big blinds it's not that big of a deal and king nine in this scenario is very very likely to be the best hand but if we're 200 big blinds deep in the same scenario where button raises we call big blind we check they bet 25 percent pot we can no longer raise and look to stack off if we check raise them here and they call or re-raise it's not good for our king nine at all. But you see some players making this blunder. Quite often these are players who are used to playing shallower stack games in general or players who play a lot of short stack tournaments, right? They get a hand like um, king jack on this board. You know, king jack's pretty good on king seven two. They'll check raise it. They'll get re-raised. They'll just blast their money and they think, oh, probably the best hand. But they're almost always behind. And this is even more and more and more true as you get deeper and deeper and deeper. So 400 big blinds deep, it would be a disaster to check raise this flop. So this hand goes from being a very premium made hand, very shallow stacked, to a very clear marginal made hand when you are deeper stacked. So deeper stacked, the plan is just to check call, check call flop, check call turn, check call river, and um, that's it. Very clear marginal made hand. So stack off threshold changes, and essentially, this impacts your strategy in a few key ways. First, on boards where you lack the nut advantage, your continuation bet frequency and your check raising frequency or your raising frequency goes down. Whenever your opponent has more nuts than you or just like a decent amount of hands that are really, really high equity and you either don't have those or your high equity range is very, very small just because they don't make up much of your range to begin with, you're going to do a whole lot more checking and calling than you are betting and raising. Also, you're gonna find that the cost of reopening the action on the river is higher because if you bet too thin, your opponent can just start raising you aggressively. Let's take a look at a few GTO examples here to show a few key adjustments 
as you get deeper and deeper stacked. So on the left, we have 100 big blind strategy. On the right, we have 200 big blind strategy. So here, button raises, big blind calls, flop comes 10, 8, 6, okay? Big blind checks. 100 big blinds deep, we are checking 23% of the time, betting, you know, a lot of our range using mixed sizes, right? Sometimes two-thirds, sometimes one-third. But take a look at the 200 big blind strategy. Even though our equity is roughly the same, 55% compared to 54% roughly, we're now checking 44% of the time when we are deeper stacked. And that's because in this scenario, even though we have some nuts in our range, so does our opponent. Our opponent's going to be sitting there with hands like 9-8, 9-7, 10-8, 8-6, right? They're going to have a lot of nuts on this board. And a lot of our range is not the nuts, even though we do have this very large concentration of offsuit and, well, mostly suited connected type hands. So... Also notice that when we do bet here, we're betting big for the most part. So we're checking more often, but when we bet, we're betting big. So essentially, we are polarizing our range right off the bat. Okay? Notice big differences. What are some big differences here? Well, take a look at aces, right? Aces is a hand that if you bet and get raised, it's it's certainly not great, and you don't want to get it in 200 big blinds deep. So that's a hand you bet less often, and it's a spot where you can check it back because you're somewhat unlikely to get outdrawn with aces. You do still see hands like Jack's betting very frequently, though. Notice Jack's is betting frequently and big on both scenarios because it's likely the best hand, but very vulnerable to being outdrawn. Notice that the marginal made hands, what are marginal made hands? Marginal made hands are going to be some eights and sixes. The eights are checking a little bit more often, just a little bit more often, deep stacked compared to 100 big blinds deep, right? Like you see queen eight betting about 60% of the time here, about 40% of the time here. Subtle difference, but take a look at the sixes. Take a look at like queen six and jack six, and nine six, right? Seven six, six five. These sixes, when you're playing 200 big blinds deep, are checking a large portion of the time, whereas 100 big blinds deep, they're actually betting still a, a large chunk of the time. So you see that the very clear marginal made hands check more often as you get deeper. Same thing with ace high, right? Like ace king, ace queen, ace jack checks a pretty large chunk of the time when we are playing 200 big blinds deep, whereas it bets a lot of the time playing deeper stacked. I'm sorry, shallower stacked. That's a lot of the time playing shallower stacked. I'm probably going to misspeak a time or two in this video. I apologize. It's hard to keep all this stuff straight in my head. So as you see, when we're deeper, we're betting less often, but more polarized in general, especially when we lack the nut advantage. Okay? Let's take a look at this out of position spot where button raises, big blind calls, flop comes, jack 6-2, big blind checks, button bets, a third pot. Okay. 100 big blinds deep, we fold 27% of the time. 200 big blinds deep, we fold 30, a little bit more. We fold a little bit more because we're going to realize our equity worse, right? And you're going to find this is another common thing. When you are out of position, you fold a little bit more often as you get deeper and deeper and deeper because hands like um, ace-8 or ace-7 are going to realize their equity just a little bit worse. I realize here they stick around roughly the same amount, but you're going to find that very often some of the weaker marginal made hands in your range are start to fold out just a touch more as you get deeper and deeper, and this applies even more as you're facing bigger and bigger bets. Also, you'll find that the hands that check raise don't check raise quite as often, or they check raise none, right? So let's take a look at a hand like ace-jack, right? Ace-jack is a hand where we're, when we're playing 100 big blinds deep, we check raise about half the time, and obviously not folding. 200 big blinds deep, though, we check raise it only about 35% uh, of the time, so a little bit less often, just a little bit. What about jack six? Take a look. 100 big blinds deep, jack six, check raises every time. 200 big blinds deep, but check raises only about 60% of the time. So a little bit less often, right? Something else you'll note is that when we're playing 100 big blinds deep, we raise small, the vast majority of the time when we raise, right? And we're raising 18.5% of the time. So we're raising a pretty good amount. Whereas when we are raising 200 big blinds deep, we're raising with mixed sizes now, some big raises, some smaller raises, and we're raising only about 14% of the time. So 18 compared to 14. So we're a little bit more cautious out of position and we fold a little bit more often, right? Notice that the hands that are raising big are gonna be the very polarized hands. So very polarized range when we're raising big, that's gonna be the nuts for sets and uh, draws, usually the bad draws like bad gut shots. So let's see if that's that holds true here. We see pocket sixes and pocket twos do do a lot of raising. And the draws are the ones using the bigger size in general, the bad draws, right? well, the, the gut shots, right? Hands that are very unlikely to be good now, but can improve to the nuts. So the hands that can improve to the nuts are usually the ones that prefer the bigger raise size in general. Okay. Let's talk about the cost of reopening 
the action on the river. When you are in position on the river, you can check back and realize 100% of your equity every single time, right? But when you bet, you may think I need to be going for value, sometimes you're going to get check raise bluffed, and then that makes you fold out your hand that has decent equity. And as you get deeper and deeper and deeper stacked, the cost of reopening the action is higher and higher because the out of position player can then check raise gigantic assuming they play well remember how we discussed whenever the player's out of position they should be checking with some nuts some portion of the time in scenarios where the player in position should be betting a decent amount of the time right and that results in their checking range being well protected to the point that if you value bet too thin they can just start check raising you very aggressively and there's not a whole lot you can do about it so for this reason you're going to find that you want to have hands that have a larger amount of equity to value bet the river when you're deeper stacked. And if you find that your particular opponent value bets too thinly, you can absolutely crush them by playing aggressively against them. Let's take a look at two examples of this concept. Folds around to us. We raise the button, of course. Big blind calls. King 10-2. They check. We bet. 20 bucks, fine and good, whatever. You can go bigger, you can go smaller. I don't think it's that big of a deal. In general, you're usually fine to use bigger bet sizes, but you know, you're, again, you're probably mixing it up to some extent. Opponent calls, turns a three, definitely a spot to go for a bet and a big bet. Nice, big, chunky bet. If this turn brought more draws, like say it brought a backdoor flush draw, you'd probably want to bet even bigger. Over betting the turn in spots where you have a lot of effective nuts and the opponent does not. Remember when they check call your flop bet, especially a big flop bet, they lose all the garbage in their range, but you still have all the garbage in your range, or a lot of it, right? So their range is pretty strong here. Our range is more nut-heavy, but a little bit weaker. So when we bet here, we're going to be betting polarized for the most part, and king-queen's definitely good enough to make a big bet here. Maybe king-jack and bet or something like that. Opponent calls. Where's the nine of spades? Opponent checks. This is a spot where we basically always have the best hand. <laughs> the problem, though, is that if we check... I'm sorry, if we bet, the opponent can check raise us pretty aggressively because they're going to have some backdoor flushes and they're also going to have some straights. And you really, really, really don't want to be against a range that is well protected and contains those hands. So this is a spot where even though we very likely have the best hand, when we go check check, we're going to win this pot almost every time. If we bet and get raised, it is awful. And if your opponent's anywhere near decent, they realize this river is not so great for all of their marginal made hands either. And they're going to start folding out a lot of their bluff catchers. So we're going to have a hard time getting much value from worse. This is a spot where maybe if you're playing against a really, really bad player, perhaps you can go for a $60 bet exploitatively to try to get called by a weak king or even a hand like ace-10. But that would be awful against good players. Good players are going to absolutely punish you if you do that. So check it back. Check, check. We win sometimes, we lose sometimes. But we're probably going to win. Let's take a look at another spot. Button raises, we call big blind with ace-10. Easy check call. Easy check call again. Notice if the opponent started using a bigger size, kind of like I was just recommending. This would be a tougher spot. Still probably call, though. River, we check. Opponent bets 70. Woo! They're, getting, uh, they're doing perhaps what I just recommended you do against the weaker players who will find calls with ace-10 in the spot, right? But this is a situation where I think we don't really want to be calling all that often. So you want to be raising in this scenario with hands that block your opponent's auto calls. Remember, you always want to be looking for spots to put in bluffs. So what are the opponent's auto calls here? Auto calls are going to be flushes, right? Just so happens we block the nut flush. Also, it's really nice that the opponent uses a $70 bet because this almost always indicates a, not, a range containing not a whole lot of premium hands. Because remember, if they had a very premium hand, they'd also be betting polarized, right? When people use this half pot size, from a GTO point of view at least, they usually are going to have hands like a lot of kings or two pair type hands. So, look, this is a spot where, um, assuming your opponent's not a big calling station, this is just a pretty easy all-in. We block the nuts. We also block the, like, sets that may call. Blast it. This is a scenario where the opponent has to be very, very cautious betting, right? I mean, imagine in our previous hand, if our opponent rips it in on the river here, if we bet any amount on the river and the opponent rips it in, we got to fold, right? Got to fold. They're going to fold a ton in this scenario. You're going to find that, again, the blocker to their auto calls is very, 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 very important. And when they bet the $70 here, most people are going to have a pretty good hand like two pair. You may say, you're risking a lot, aren't you? Yeah, we are. But 
it's going to succeed a lot. <laughs> You're going to find that your opponents fold a large, large, large chunk of the time in that scenario. And, you know, you, you should be balanced if you are playing against someone who is good. But that's a, that's a hand that is particularly great to shove there that a lot of people don't because you block the auto calls, right? Okay, you're gonna find that also position is even more valuable. As the stack to pot ratio increases as you get deeper and deeper, being the one who can put in the last bet is huge because you essentially determine the size of the pot. So this will affect your post-flop strategies by seeing the out of position player checking way more often. Remember we saw a few spots where the out of position player, like say you raise low jack and the button calls, we saw a few spots, 100 big blinds deep, like um, king seven five, king king six, where that player could get away with betting big 100% of the time. But that does not exist anymore as you get deeper and deeper and deeper. Also, you're going to find that in general, in spots where um, you, you should often be using a more polarized strategy again, but you're going to find from out of position you still do use some small bets. Also, you're going to find that if you really want to go deep on poker, you may want to start implementing a more complex strategy to use three bet sizes on the flop. We've been discussing a third and two thirds this entire course for simplicity. That does leave a little bit of value on the table compared to a strategy that uses one third, two thirds, and three, and a full, full pot, right? If you wanted to go really deep, you could add five sizes, whatever, right? You can make poker as difficult as you want to. But as you get deeper and deeper, there is a decent amount of value to be had in adding an additional bigger bet size to your potential options. Um, doing this will essentially make the pot bigger with a strong polarized range. So you're going to find that a pot size bet with a very polarized range of like nuts and junky draws is quite good. It's going to put your opponents in a pretty tough spot. So let's take a look at a scenario where we raise low jack, button calls, flop comes ace, jack, five. Okay? 100 big blinds deep, we check about half the time. 200 big blinds deep, we check 62% of the time, despite having basically the same range and basically the same equity. Same range advantage, same range. We're checking 62% out of position compared to 50 in position. Uh, I'm sorry, 50 uh, out of position, 200 big blinds deep compared to 100 big blinds deep. So what are some differences? And if you take a look, basically every hand's checking a little bit more often across the board. But notably, a lot of the ace X's are checking more often. And that's just because on this board with a flush draw, there's going to be more runouts where a hand like ace king is just not the effective nuts. So you're going to be betting it a little bit less often. And again, just like look at literally every hand, right? We see like pocket jacks checks a little bit more often. Ace jack checks a little bit more often. Ace queen checks a little bit more often. Under pairs check a little bit more often. We are still betting with a lot of, a lot of hands in general in this spot using a very, very mixed strategy, but just a whole lot more checking out of position. Take a look at the uh, King 7 5 board. This is one where 100 big blinds deep, you can bet big every time because you have loads and loads of good kings, right? Pairs are pretty great, etc. 200 big blinds deep, though, we see a very different strategy. Again, using mostly small bets, but now betting with our a much more polarized range in general. Obviously, the strategy is still very mixed, but if you look at it, most of the good kings are betting um, various hands like under pairs, bottom pairs, et cetera, are betting. Again, it's, it's a tough thing to actually figure out exactly what, like how to play this from an implementable point of view. From out of position, you should just be mixing it up a lot. But we see some of the quote unquote marginal made hands like ace 10 and ace jack doing a lot of checking. Same thing with hands like pocket queens doing a lot of checking. So hands like that are probably gonna fall into a checking range if you're using an implementable strategy. Whereas um, stuff like king, queen, and king jack probably wanna be betting. Maybe king 10 and king nine check from implementable point of view. Maybe low ace X back door draws can do some betting. Maybe like ace queen and ace jack do more checking, et cetera. But, but obviously, I want to show you this is a really, really clear difference because even though we have the same amount of equity, the fact that we are out of position forces us to have a stronger hand to stack off, right? And it turns out a lot of our hands in this scenario, like king jack, are good, but are they good enough to stack off? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Also, you're going to want to use... Bigger bet sizes in general across the board for the most part. And again, you may want to add a third bet size to your flop betting strategy. On the turn, you're going to find that when you over bet 100 big blinds deep, very often you're using 120% pot bet size. But, but 200 big blinds deep, you're going to find that that big bet size gets even bigger. 
And as you're deeper and deeper stacked, that bet size can get even bigger and bigger and bigger because when you're betting this big bet size, you're very polarized, right? And when you're very polarized, there's not a whole lot your opponent can do about it. So let's take a look at some examples. Here we raise big blind calls, 10, eight, five opponent checks. Well, we actually had a similar spot to this earlier. Let me go back and find it. 10, eight, sorry, sorry it's, board's 10, eight, five. 10, eight, six is the example we had earlier. Earlier, you saw that we, we're gonna be betting jacks close to 100% of the time in both of these spots, but the small bet sizes use sometimes 100 big blinds deep, but never 200 big blinds deep, right? And that's because when we're deeper and deeper, we're usually gonna want to be polarizing our range right off the bat using a uh, bigger size in general. So this is a spot where shallower stack, you're probably gonna mix it up if you felt inclined. You saw the over pairs were like all mixing various bet sizes, big and small, but mostly betting. Here, you're going to just basically always bet big. So we do go 25% pot. Let's just play this hand out to the river, see what happens. Opponent calls, turns a king. Well, think about stack off threshold, right? We probably have the best hand, but if we bet and get raised or even called, we don't love it. Sorry about that. Ruin the hand. <laughs> um, this is the spot where we got to check it back on the turn pretty clearly. On the river, if the opponent checks, what do we do? It's kind of similar to that king-queen hand we saw earlier, where if we bet and get raised, it's pretty miserable. If you're playing against a lot of opponents who will just always have a 10 or an 8 here because they always bet a flush on the river or they always bet a king on the river, then, you know, maybe you can get away with a $40 bet to try to get full value from a 10 or an 8. But again, if your opponent is good and they're protecting their checking range, you cannot justify a value bet here. This one, opponent bets $20. So this is a very easy call in basically all games. However, again, if your opponent's especially terrible and you know that this small bet indicates exactly a 10, no kings, exactly a 10 or an 8, and you think they're going to call you with a 10 or an 8 if you raise, then you should just raise because if their small bet means literally a 10 only, then you have the nuts, right? And there really aren't a ton of kings they should have in their range when they call your kind of big flop bet, if you think about it. They could have king 10, but a lot of people bet bigger on the river with king 10 or, 10 8, or king 8, right? And if they check raise all the two pair and sets on the flop and they check raise draws on the flop, it means they have a 10 or an 8, right? However, most people are not that awful at poker. I know a lot of people like to think their opponents are atrociously terrible, and, you know, maybe some of them are. But you're going to find that most of your opponents are at least somewhat competent, and when they are structuring their small bet size range, they are going to have a few flushes here, and they are also going to have some hands that they're just betting and calling, like a king. So... This is a very easy call due to pot odds, due to beating a lot of your opponent's 10s and 8s that will value bet here. I mean, think back to the GTO strategy out of position. We should be uh, ch betting here small with a lot of marginal made hands, right? That's, that are probably good, like a 10, like maybe even an 8, like a king. But this is not a spot where we can raise for value, so just easily call. Here we raise king 10 suited, big blind calls, opponent checks. We can mix it up with our bet sizes here. We go 7 this time. I probably would have just liked a $15 bet. Whatever. Opponent calls. Turns to six. Ooh. All the flush draws arrive. You're going to find, from a GTO point of view, deep stacked, or well, even 100 big blinds deep, you're going to want to use a big bet size here. Anytime the turn brings two flush draws, you have a load of draws, and you also have a load of nuts. And here you want to be very polarized. So if pot's 35, we're going to want to go 150% pot, give or take, using a pretty, pretty polarized range. So we do go 55. Good. Opponent calls, rivers a two, they check. Can we go for value here? Well, I think the answer is obviously yes. We have essentially the nuts. You may say, oh, but you lose to pocket fives and pocket sixes and four or three of spades and four or three of hearts. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we also beat everything else. So this is a scenario where we have a very, very easy big bet. Now we're probably a little bit too deep to shove it all in. I have to imagine if we gave the GTO a... Uh, three and a half x pot all in here it would probably just be mostly like sets so we're probably supposed to have multiple sizes here if i had to guess you're gonna find gto very often jams stuff like the middle and bottom set here and um uses big but not all in sizes of stuff like king 10 and king king six so we do go 200 dollars. i think this is fine and good you may say but my opponents always fold when i overbet the river well, then, obviously, if your opponents make a gigantic blunder of always folding to an overbet on the river, you should be overbetting with entirely bluffs and betting whatever amount they'll call with the nuts. But again, I'm presuming our opponent is not terrible. This is a spot where if the opponent does have a king, they should probably just find a call. They block our value bets. They don't block our bluffs to some extent, right? Um, 
that said, exploitatively, if you know your opponent's only overbet with the nuts and you're sitting here with like, I don't know, king, king seven, king seven of hearts, it's probably just a fold, right? If you know your opponents do not use good, strong polarized strategies. But against a good player, if you're sitting here with the king, you just got to call when all the draws miss. When all the draws miss, you have to be a little bit call happy. And notice, this is a spot where most people bet $20 on the turn. Pot would have been only 75 there. They bet $50 on the river and they get called. So they went 70 bucks on the turn in the river. Here we ended up winning like 250 just by using a good, strong, polarized strategy that is closer to the GTO strategy. Okay. Also, we're going to find that nut advantage drives strategy and the ability to make the nuts slash block the nuts goes way up in value. So when deciding which draws to check raise or barrel, you want to use draws that make the nuts more often. These are going to be straight draws and flush draws, ace high flush draws, even stuff like gut shots to the nuts. You want to be drawing to the nuts. You do not want to be drawing to hands that are not the nuts because when you make a strong but non-nut hand and a bunch of money goes in, uh, that's not so good. Also, you're going to find that you want to fold draws that have big reverse implied odds, especially when you're out of position on the turn when lots of money starts to go in the pot because some of your outs will be dead. And also, you don't really want to be check calling out of position with something like a nine high draw because then you can't really win on the river when you miss, right? So when you have the nut advantage, you want to be applying pressure and you want, because you're going to be drastically over-realizing your equity in general. So let's go through a few examples here. So let's take a look at low jack, well, big blind versus low jack on jack 6-6, six, six. okay? In this scenario, we are facing a, I think, small bet on the flop. Small, but uh, a bet a decent amount of the time. So, 100 big blinds deep, you see we are raising 18% of the time, right? But 200 big blinds deep, we're raising 25% of the time. A pretty good amount more, right? Also, interestingly enough, we're using a lot of small sizes 200 big blinds deep. That's because, in this scenario, when we have a 6, we don't really care if our opponent sticks around. And, um, you know, we, we, we want to be raising with just more bluffs that are and pick up additional equity on the later betting round. So we see stuff like, um, like Queen 10, right, raising a large chunk of the time. We see just like sporadic, um, sporadic nonsense going for bluffs a large chunk of the time, right? Also, we see slightly more thin value bets because we are going for, um, well, we're going for more bluffs. But also, notice our nuts here, our sixes, are still in great, 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 great shape. You can go for thinner value when you check raise in spots where your opponent just cannot re-raise you because in this scenario, your opponent can't re-raise you. They can't just go around re-raising with um, you know, pocket aces because if they have a six, you're in terrible, terrible, terrible shape. So we can go for more raises because a lot of our draws are going to be able to make the opponent fold out very strong hands by the river. Like imagine you check raise the queen nine, your opponent calls, you bet the turn, big, you bet the river, big. It's a miserable spot, even with pocket aces. If you can make even pocket aces very miserable, that's clearly a very good spot. So here, you have a, a nut advantage in the big blind, so you're going to be check raising more often. Okay? Let's take a look at this scenario. Big blind versus cutoff 60% bet on queen 8-7. Here, we lack the nut advantage, right? The opponent's going to have, like, we just don't have a whole lot of nuts here. And we're pretty deep stacked. So here we're lacking nuts and we're deep stacked. So lacking nuts and deep stacked, you're going to find that we don't raise all that often. When we do raise, it's going to be with draws that are pretty good. So notice we're raising queen eight, queen seven, eights, and sevens, obviously very good hands. Then what? Six, five, nine, six, seven, six for the bottom pair draw, various flush draws. So notice we're raising with a bunch of various flush draws, which are all pretty good. And, um... A few of these, well, I suppose these are these are straight-end flush draws that are raising, right? So the 6-5 and the 9-6 that are raising are almost entirely flush draw. Flush draw with straight draw. So again, very strong combo draws, high equity flush draws, and super nuts. And then everything else is calling. Notice a lot of folding, 41%, right? Because again, we're out of position, deep stack, we're going to under-realize our equity. Um, as you see here, the flush draws that are raising are mostly the high equity ones, right? So we see 10-9 raising a lot, 
combo draw. 9-6, combo draw. 6-5, combo draw. Ace highs are really good. And then we see a lot of the weaker ones doing a little bit more calling, like the 5-4, um, 6-5, 5-3, right? A lot of these weaker combo draws do more calling. Okay? So realize we're not always raising every flush draw here. A lot of people make the error of taking literally every flush draw and raising. So you're going to find that cards that wrap around the 8 and the 6, I'm sorry, the 8 and the 7, so 9, 6, 10, 9, 6, 5, these are the ones that do more raising because they're going to make more premium hands on more runouts than the naked flush draws, right? Also notice that hands like Ace Track and Ace 10 do a lot of calling because they can, um, they can just check call flop, check, check turn, check, check river and win some portion of the time. They have more showdown value. Also notice that stuff like 8-5 um, and 8-6, pair plus flush draw. I got to imagine the same thing with the 7. I actually don't have any 7s for whatever. Oh, we don't, I'm sorry. We don't have 7s, obviously. 7s um, on the board. But yeah, 8-6 and 8-5 do a lot of calling, right? Notice all the 8s do a lot of calling. So pair plus flush draws are often doing a lot of calling in the spot because they, again, have showdown value. All right, let's talk about big blind strategy versus cutoff on 8 Queen, eight, seven, six. So big blind checks, cut off bets. Big blind raises, cut off calls on the sixth turn. So in this scenario, while we do have a lot of draws, a lot of the rest of our range is really, really good, right? Like again, all these two pairs are really good. These hands that are very high frequency are mostly like really, really good hands in this scenario, right? So this is a spot where we have sets that are still very, very strong. And high equity draws, right? Which are also very, very strong. Notice also a lot of our draws in this scenario are going to have a nine, which bumps up their equity a bit, right? So this is a spot where we are going to continue betting very, very frequently. Um, we're checking 38%. What are we mostly checking? Notice marginal made hand here. Draw that did not complete at all here. Some top pairs, right? Top pairs make sense to check if we have them at this point. If you do check raise the top pair here, like ace, queen, or queen, jack, and you do get called... Um, your opponent's range gets very strong, right? So now these hands become decent, but still marginal to some extent. Let's take a look at this spot. Let's say we bet the turn and the opponent calls, and the river is the king of spades. So now sets go way down in value, two pairs go way down in value, right? Notice now that we want to be sure we still have some nuts in our range. But take a look at this general strategy in this spot, right? While we are betting some of our nut flushes, some of our flushes, our nut flushes are checking. You see ace-five, ace-four, ace-three, and we have them are checking a large chunk of the time in the spot, right? To protect the checking range, which is also stuff like sets, two pairs, etc. cetera. Um, Ten-nine is still value betting. Notice we have some various nines that are bluffing, like ace-nine if we had it, the ace-nine offsuit, check raises, flop, and goes for it. Notice six-five. Actually, this is going to be spades, right? Most of the time, so that makes sense. Um... So yeah, as you see in this scenario, you want to be able to make the bets on, or you may want to be able to make the nuts on essentially all runouts. And this is why it's important to make sure you have some good draws in your checking range and check calling range. And if we go back to the flop over here, you see that this is why we're mixing it up very much with our flush draws. Because when we check call, we want to be able to make the absolute nuts sometimes. And when we check raise, we want to be able to make the absolute nuts sometimes. A lot of people make the error of just always raising all their draws or always raising all their nut draws and calling all their non-nut draws. But... I mean, to be fair, it's probably better to have draws in both of your ranges than not, but you want to make sure you are, to some extent, mixing it up. I know this is going to be difficult to do in-game. Personally, what I do, I call a lot of the ones that have higher showdown value, like ace-jack, like 10-8 for the pair, and I raise the ones that lack showdown value. And if you look at the GTO strategy, it kind of does that, right? Like, it's raising the weaker ace-x suited, raising the weaker king-x suited, raising the draws with straight outs that also lack showdown value. And it mostly calls the uh, really bad draws, and the generally higher equity draws that can improve to stuff like top pair or win unimproved. Let's take a look at one more spot deep stacked. Here, low jack versus big blind. Flop comes ace, jack, five. Big blind checks, button bets a third. Big blind calls, turns an eight. Big blind checks. Okay? This is a spot where the player on the... Low jack should be barreling very polarized, right? And notice when we are betting turn, we're betting very big. Wouldn't be shocked if we're supposed to use an even bigger bet in this scenario. Take a look at the strategy that is, or the hands that are betting. It's going to be all the hands that are very likely good, plus some bluffs. So what are the bluffs in this spot? Well, the bluffs are going to be hands that block the opponent's 
nuts, right? And whenever you block the nuts from your opponent, the, the river nuts for your opponent, like with king of spades 10, you can bet the turn. And if you get called, you can just, again, continue betting very, very big on the river. So notice here, we see how king of spades X plays, or king of spades 10 and king 10 of spades plays. They're mostly betting using the big size, right? And um, they're going to continue barreling on a lot of rivers, whereas the king 10 with no spade is doing a whole lot of checking, right? You want to be able to block the opponent's auto calls on the river, which will be flushes, clearly, and blocking a spade is very relevant. Also, we see queen jack here betting. This is queen jack of spades. This is essentially being used as a high equity draw because when you blast the turn, your opponent, from a GTO point of view, should start folding out some weak aces. So in this scenario, you can bet, and when you do get called, sometimes you have the best hand, but quite often you're getting your opponent to fold out a hand like a weaker ace, which is also very powerful. Um, notice stuff like 10-9, a very strong draw, continues betting. Kind of interesting to see Jack-10 and Jack-9 continuing to bet at this point. These are essentially being used as bluffs to try to get your opponent off of the ace, right? Kind of cool to see. Um, notice a lot of the ace-x checking, very clear marginal made hands here. So we're betting very polarized, and in this spot, it's actually kind of hard to come up with logical draws, right? Whenever it's kind of hard to come up with logical draws, you start using stuff like middle pairs and um, bottom pairs that block some of your opponent's hands that will obviously call like um, two pairs, right? So pretty cool spots. But as you see, big bet sizes being used in these scenarios. When they bet the flop and get called, quite often the big bet sizes are what you're going to pull out. Again, I want to recap. The three main differences. Your stack off threshold is higher. You need to have a hand with higher equity to happily get your money in as you get deeper and deeper. This is going to result in a little bit more checking, especially from out of position, a little bit more folding from out of position, and also using more polarized bets when you are betting, right? Especially when you're in position, you're usually going to be going for big bet sizes because when you have the nuts, you want to be able to get the money in the pot. And if you're betting very polarized, you get to include a lot of bluffs. And also nut advantage matters very much as we get deeper and deeper and the ability to make the nuts and or block the nuts like we saw that king 10 with king of spades or 10 of spades goes up in value so keep these three things in mind when you're playing deep stacked and um besides these three things for the most part you play very similarly similarly to when you are playing 100 big blinds deep